All right, and we are live once again. Thank you for joining us as we kick off another entry in the Retirement and Inheritance webinar series from Unchained Capital, a monthly webinar focused on providing you with ongoing education on how to save your Bitcoin in retirement. I'm Connor Dolan. I am on the Client Solutions team here at Unchained Capital, and I will be helping lead the discussion today along with our Head of Retirement and Inheritance, Jeff Vandrew, as we jump into a topic that we are constantly asked about here at Unchained, how to think through inheritance planning in a hyper-Bitcoinized world. Now, as always, before we get into it, a few quick housekeeping items. This webinar will be recorded and a replay will be made live on our YouTube channel here in a couple of weeks. If you'd like and you're watching the webinar live, you can actually download this presentation deck directly from the webinar platform by clicking the little cloud icon in the top right corner of the window. And of course, as always, we will leave time at the end for Q&A. If you'd like to participate in the Q&A, there is a questions box in the bottom right corner of the window. Please navigate there to submit any questions you would like answered at the end, as well as vote on other questions that have been asked that you would like discussed. With that, let's take a look at the agenda for today's discussion. So shortly, I'm gonna pass it over to Jeff and he will kick off our conversation by focusing on title and possession. What are they and how do they pertain to inheritance planning? Then we will actually start diving into how to establish an inheritance plan. We'll talk through the probate process. What is it and how can you plan around it? Jeff's also going to go through non-probate assets, as well as the structure of revocable living trusts. <clears throat> and then we will spend some time at the end talking through how you can leverage your Unchained Capital account uh, to assist with inheritance planning. And of course, we'll leave time at the end for Q&A. So really looking forward to the discussion today. I think we should just jump right into it. As Benjamin Franklin famously once said, there are two certainties in life death and taxes. Well, I think it's safe to say at this point, we can add a couple more items to that list. Bitcoin and Jeff Vandrew dropping absolute knowledge bombs every time he joins these webinars. I have a feeling today is gonna be no different. Mr. Vandrew, how are you doing today? Doing good, man, can't complain. Weather's beautiful. Just got a one inch rotary hammer on sale. So I can't ask for a better day than that today. You know, that is uh, that is good news. I love to hear it and um, really excited to have you. You know, you and I were talking yesterday just about this broader topic and you were mentioning that there is a misconception in regards to some of the complexities surrounding Bitcoin inheritance. And I thought it was a really interesting point and a great way for us to kick off our conversation today. So if you don't mind, uh, I'd love for you to elaborate on what we were talking about yesterday. Yeah. So, it, I mean, for everybody that's out here listening to this webinar today, obviously, we tremendously appreciate you coming to listen to what we have to say. Um, but one thing I want to let you know is if you're here, you're probably overthinking this by a factor of 10, uh, which is which is a good thing, right? I'm, um, a lot of this presentation today is going to be going through why a lot of this is a lot easier than you might think. Um, or, well, actually, I shouldn't quite say it that way. The better way to put it is, if you're an unchained client, it's a lot easier than you might think, because uh, as we're going to discuss in a minute, the legal side of everything, which we're going to be talking about is title. Um, that's no different than any other asset you have with regard to your estate plan. That's very, very straightforward. And if you have a good estate plan, you're pretty much good to go there. Where Bitcoin is different, and this isn't unique to inheritance really, is regarding the possession angle, right? Because of the way Bitcoin is a cryptographic asset. But the good news is, as we're going to talk about later in this uh, presentation, if you're an unchained client, you've already got that handled uh, and your loved ones have it handled as well. So that's that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about here today. So with that, I'll kind of jump into this distinction between title and possession. It's very important to have the difference between these two things in mind. Right. So title in a nutshell means I have a legal entitlement to an asset. It is mine. I am the owner of it, right? Possession is very different. Possession just means like I have it. Maybe I'm supposed to have it. Maybe I'm not supposed to have it. Uh, maybe someone let me have it. Who knows? But I've got it. That's possession. 
So the classic example to sort of illustrate the difference here is a thief. So if I have, let's use a physical item because it's a little easier to uh, conceptualize in our brains here. If I have, let's say, a gold bar in my house, right? I just, I have it in, let's say I don't even have it in my safe. I've got it in my nightstand. So I have title to that gold bar and I have possession for that gold bar. If Connor sneaks in my house at night and goes in my nightstand and grabs that gold bar and runs off with it, Connor has possession of that gold bar, but he doesn't have title. Uh, he doesn't have good title anyway. Sometimes that's referred to as what's having uh, called void title. So if you have possession and you don't have title, uh, that's not the same as having possession and title. So because namely, if I figure out that Connor is the guy that stole my gold bar, because he doesn't have title, I can sue him. I can sue him to get that gold bar back. Or if he loses or otherwise disposes of that gold bar, I can sue him for the amount of my loss, you know, uh, with respect to that gold bar. So in the, in the context of estate planning, it's actually not all that different. Um, you, your loved ones that you want to receive your Bitcoin after death, they have to ha end up with both title and possession. If they don't, let's say they only end up with possession but not title, uh, they're actually going to be in a position that's not all that different than a thief. The person who has proper title is going to be able to sue them to get that Bitcoin back or get the financial value back, whichever the case might be. The flip side is if they have title, but they don't have possession, well, that's great, but they, you know, they have a legal entitlement to your Bitcoin. But for instance, if they can't find your keys, that's not going to do them very much good, right? Uh, that Bitcoin could theoretically be gone forever. Yeah, that's, so that's that great. We're going to kind of, oh, sorry, you go ahead, Connor. I cut you no, off. I was just going to say, I, I think we'll cover title versus possession really throughout this entire presentation and towards the end, talk through how Unchained can help from the possession side of things. Uh, before we get into that, though, maybe we can just talk more broadly about, you know, setting up a Bitcoin inheritance plan in general. Yeah, and that's a really good point. So the title versus possession distinction is very important because there's two sides to this you know, with Bitcoin, um, with some assets. So Bitcoin is actually very similar to a bar of gold in that you have to worry about both the title and the possession with your bank account. You don't really have to worry about the possession side of it, right? When you're doing your estate planning, because the bank possesses it. Um, so, you know, like your bank account can't, can't get quote unquote lost. So in a way, Bitcoin is sort of like a return to the old school where you had to worry about both the title and possession issues. So title to your Bitcoin is going to be handled by drafting an estate planning, an estate plan with an attorney. So in sort of the classic situation is if you die and you're the owner of your Bitcoin, whoever gets your stuff under your will, that's the person who gets title to your Bitcoin, just like any other asset. The title piece of this is no different than any of your other assets. And the key part to handling the title piece is meeting with an attorney and getting that estate plan drawn up. Uh, other parts of the estate plan might include a power of attorney that would give someone the legal entitlement to deal with your assets while you're alive, but disabled again, because if they just have possession of your Bitcoin and you're disabled and they start dealing with it, they don't have a legal entitlement to do that. So one of your other relatives could end up suing them based on what they're doing with your Bitcoin. If they have a power of attorney, in addition to having possession of that Bitcoin, that means not only do they have the ability to deal with your Bitcoin when you're disabled, but they also have the legal entitlement to do so. So you always want to keep both of those pieces of the puzzle uh, in, in play here. And then lastly, your estate plan may also involve a trust. Uh, there's a variety of different reasons for that. If some of your beneficiaries are underage, uh, obviously that would be a good thing to set up if you're worried about a beneficiary getting divorced. Uh, just like any other asset in that regard, all the same reasons you would set up a trust for your other assets would be the reason you would set them up for your Bitcoin. Um, the one specific type of trust we're going to talk about later that's kind of of interest to Bitcoiners would be a revocable living trust. So again, to emphasize the title side, that we at Unchained would not legally be able to help you with. You have to meet with an attorney to get a good estate plan drafted up. And while it may be helpful that your attorney understands Bitcoin, it's actually not critical um, because, again, Bitcoin is dealt with like any other asset in terms of how the title passes under your estate plan. 
possession is the more unique side of it. And that's where Unchained comes in. So every Unchained client, we don't, we don't make you sign up with a spec for a special quote unquote inheritance product for us to help you with this. Every single Unchained client, when you pass away, uh, if the executor of your will or the trustee of your trust comes to us and they provide appropriate documentation to prove that they're your executor or your trustee, we're there to hold their hand, walk them through the process step by step. That's what our concierge team does. Um, they will help and assist that loved one of yours the same way that they would assist you while you're still alive. Um, so that's a tremendous benefit. And again, that is something we do for every single Unchained client. You do not need to sign up for some special Rube Goldberg uh, inheritance product for us to do that for you. The other nice thing about Unchained is we're holding one of your keys as a backup. So if for some reason your executor or your trustee after you're deceased is only able to find one of your keys instead of being able to find two of them, Again, we have that backup, so we'll still be able to move those coins. And then just like with our, you know, any other client, uh, the, our concierge term can, team, excuse me, can help an executor or trustee with setting up a hardware wallet, creating their own multi-sig for the beneficiaries that are ultimately going to get the coins, moving the Bitcoin to an appropriate address that belongs to one of the beneficiaries. We're here to assist with all of those things. Again, for every single Unchained client, that's something our concierge team is available to do. Yep, absolutely. And uh, we will expand on that even further in terms of what that actually looks like in practice uh, later in the discussion. But all of this comes back to the idea of title versus possession and Unchained can help on the possession component and uh, in some regards on the title component as well. Uh, next up, I think we're, we're gonna spend some time walking through uh, the probate process. And uh, maybe I'll just open it up generally. I think a lot of people hear the word probate and have an idea it exists, but don't really know what it actually means. So uh, maybe Jeff, you can uh, just kick it off by talking through what is probate more broadly and, and how does it pertain to inheritance planning? Yeah, so probate is the process of executing the instructions in your will uh, regarding all uh, your assets after you die. So probate applies to any assets that are titled to you as an individual uh, with some exceptions that we're going to talk about in a minute. So when you die, title to all your assets vests in whoever the person is that you designate as the executor in your will. So at, at, as, he, as the person holding title to those assets, he basically collects up all your assets, he pays off your debts, and then he's responsible for whatever's left over after paying off all your debts, distributing that to the beneficiaries that are listed in your will. He's basically bound by the instructions that you give him in your will. So the actual probate process in terms of how that works varies a lot state to state. So the two states at complete opposite ends of the spectrum are California and New Jersey. So California is a heavily court supervised process that's very expensive. Your executor basically has to show up in court and get permission before he does almost anything. Um, and the, the probate court actually charges a lot of fees for that. The total opposite ends of the spectrum is New Jersey, where the process is not court supervised at all. Uh, the probate office in New Jersey, which is called the surrogate's office, is not a real court. Uh, there's no real judge in there. Uh, it's basically just you go in there and you talk to a nice lady who helps you through the whole thing. Uh, and there's no court supervision unless the beneficiaries are fighting is the short story. Otherwise, it's all handled privately um, or I should. Well, privately with a caveat, as I'll explain in a second. Uh, otherwise, it's all handled just among the executor and the beneficiaries. And there's just a final filing at the very end, just letting the surrogate's office know that everything's done. So states all fall somewhere in that spectrum. Some are more like California. Some are more like New Jersey. Some are somewhere in the middle. Uh, so depending on your state, probate could be a very easy process where you don't even need a lawyer like New Jersey. It could be a very complicated process where you need a lawyer for every single little thing and it's outrageously expensive like California. And it, or it could be in the middle where uh, you might need a lawyer for a few things, but it's not all that expensive. The thing with probate, though, is that in every state, there are public records filings. So even in a state like New Jersey, where uh, it's basically all handled, 
I don't want to say off the books, but, uh, you know, not through court supervision. Uh, there still are certain records that get filed in the surrogate's office, namely the names and addresses of all the beneficiaries and a rough itemization of all the assets and debts. Um, those aren't like searchable on the internet, but if someone knows the county where you died, they could walk in and ask for a copy of it, right? And public records laws would allow them to get a copy of it. So that is one downside of the probate process. Um, there are ways to avoid the probate process altogether. Uh, the main way to do that is the a revocable living trust, which we're going to talk about later. Uh, in some states, revocable living trusts are very common, like California, as you can imagine, where probate is an agonizing, awful process. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, revocable living trusts are less common, like New Jersey. Uh, they're very uncommon in New Jersey because um, – Probate is not that difficult of a process. However, if you are privacy-minded, even in a state like New Jersey where it's not particularly expensive or difficult, you still may want to use the revocable living trust to avoid those sorts of public records filings. As promised, uh, knowledge bombs left and right once again. Uh, quick reminder here uh, for those in the chat. Uh, there is a separate section for submitting questions in the bottom right. Please make sure to submit all questions there and vote on the ones you'd like answered. Uh, so we just spent some time talking through the probate process. Next up, let's give a quick overview of non-probate assets and how those yeah. are handled. Yeah, so certain assets just aren't subject to probate at all. Um, IRAs by federal law are not subject to probate. Uh, they just pass to whoever you name directly on the IRA itself as your death beneficiary. They do not become a part of your estate. Your executor doesn't mess with them. They don't end up in those public records filings. Uh, the other thing are transfer on death or payable on death accounts. So certain banks will let you add a TOD or POD designation to an account. If you do that, when you die, the person just receives those assets directly. Again, not part of the probate process. Life insurance, similar deal. Whoever you name is your death beneficiary on your life insurance, not part of the probate process. Annuities work pretty much the same way as life insurance. And then lastly, which we're going to go to further in depth, are any assets that before your death that you title to a revocable living trust, those are also going to pass outside of the probate process. Yeah, so with that said, I mean, we'll talk a little bit about revocable living trusts right now. Revocable living trusts are, they're sort of distinct from other trusts that are used in estate planning because they're actually more like a will than a trust. Um, they are a probate avoidance mechanism. Basically, you, you retitle all of your assets into a revocable living trust while you're still alive. So your bank account, your brokerage account, like all, you, you know, all these different things. Um, and if you do that, what happens is your trustee will be able to distribute those assets after you pass away um, under the instructions that you give in the revocable living trust document without having to do any public records filings or any sort of court supervision. So that is the advantage to the revocable living trust. It does require that you hire an attorney to draft up the revocable living trust document itself. And you got to get all those assets, all those other, the, all the assets other than non-probate assets, right? So you don't have to, you don't retitle your life insurance, or your IRAs or anything like that, but all your assets that would otherwise be probate assets, you got to retitle them out of your name and into the name of the RLT for this plan to work. While you're still alive, even though they're titled into the RLT, the RLT document says you can use them just like any other assets. Like no one can prevent you from spending that money, doing anything like that. But they do have to be formally retitled into the RLT itself before you die for the plan to work. And with that said, you know, that's a good segue here. I want to sort of turn it over to Connor. So Connor is going to discuss how you can retitle an unchained vault into an RLT uh, if you have an attorney draft up an RLT for you to, to get that privacy gain. And he's also going to talk about, regardless of whether you use an RLT or whether you let your assets pass through a more traditional will, he's going to talk about uh, the types of services that unchained concierge can provide for your loved ones after you pass away 
to make sure they've got the possession side of that estate planning handled. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so as, as Jeff stated in the next section, we are going to spend some time discussing how you can leverage your Unchained Capital account in a variety of different ways to assist with your Bitcoin inheritance planning. Uh, but before we do that, though, I think it'd be important to just briefly cover a refresher on what Unchained Capital actually does. So in short, at the core of our company, our main mission is to empower individuals to custody their own Bitcoin wealth without relying on a third party uh, by teaching individuals how to hold their own private keys. Now, we're not going to spend a ton of time going down the technical rabbit hole today, as there are a lot of resources that we have on our YouTube channel and on our website that can really elaborate on the technical background of this. But through cryptography, Bitcoin allows you to be your own bank by securing your own digital private keys, which can be accomplished by using a hardware wallet like this Trezor that I'm holding up here, a device that helps you store your own digital private key and create addresses on the Bitcoin network. Now I can use one of these address, one of these devices on its own to help create addresses on the Bitcoin network that have just one private key, one digital private key associated with it. But additionally, native to the Bitcoin protocol is the ability to create an address that has multiple private keys associated with it using multiple of these devices. The benefit of that being is you can create a structure with an address that has multiple private keys so that if you were to ever lose one, you can still recover your Bitcoin. And that's ultimately where Unchained Capital comes into play. So what we do at Unchained Capital is help you create addresses on the Bitcoin network that have three private keys associated with the Bitcoin address. And we set it up so that you need any two of those three keys in order to access the Bitcoin. This is called a two of three multi-signature address. And as you see on the, as you can see on the screen here, we structure it so that we hold one key and you hold two keys in the form of two hardware wallets and their digital private keys. You can kind of think about it like a digital safety deposit box that has three keys, three keyholes, and you need any two of those three keys in order to actually access the Bitcoin. In that setup, we really serve as, as the banker in a sense. We only have one key. We don't have the ability to open that digital safety deposit box ourselves. All we can do is help you access the Bitcoin. You on the other end have two keys in the form of two hardware wallets. You can access the Bitcoin at any time, even if we disappear off the face of the earth, not like that will ever happen. But most importantly in this setup, not only are you still the only person in the world that has the ability to access the Bitcoin, there is redundancy so that if you were to ever lose one of your keys or one of your keys was compromised, Unchained Capital can help you recover the Bitcoin with our backup key. And we'll talk through in just a second how that can apply specifically to inheritance planning as well, having Unchained Capital share that responsibility of securing the keys. Now, if this sounds overwhelming, not to worry, uh, we have a concierge onboarding service that you can sign up for where we will walk you through every step of the process from setting up these devices to building your vault to showing you how to recover using open source software. You can, if it, on the screen here, we will have a, a link pop up that you can sign up for, for a consultation to talk through how to do that with someone from our team. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, just visit our website at unchained.com. So importantly, if we think through this structure, the broader idea of our platform is that every address built on our platform is structured this way. So with one username and login and two of these hardware wallets, you can build as many of these two of three addresses on our platform as you'd like to manage all of your Bitcoin wealth. Your personal Bitcoin, you can set up a vault for an IRA. And as Jeff was mentioning, you can set up a vault specifically for a trust that you own. And so that really gets into our discussion today on inheritance planning with Unchained Capital. So as I just mentioned, you can set up a vault that is registered on behalf of, for example, a revocable living trust. So if you go through the process, we're not going to help you set up the revocable living trust here at Unchained Capital. But if you already have one established or go and establish one, any Bitcoin that is owned by that revocable living trust can be 
held in this same two of three structure, allowing you to still be the only person in the world that has access to that Bitcoin, but you're not on an island in terms of actually securing those private keys and securing the Bitcoin. As Jeff was mentioning, <clears throat> outside whether you end up leveraging the revocable living trust to enforce that title uh, in a much more official and formal way, every address that's built on our platform, <clears throat> we, we hold one of the three keys to. And so from an inheritance planning standpoint, that adds for a lot of flexibility because as long as one of your keys or their seed phrases is passed along, we can help recover the Bitcoin as long as the proper title has been enforced. And so an example of that is you could take one of your seed phrases, one of the backup phrases to your hardware wallets, and for example, give it to an attorney or a loved one that you can ensure that that seed phrase is gonna be passed on to your next generation. The benefit of that being as long as proper title has been established, and Jeff can certainly elaborate on this, we will always work with the executor of an estate and probate court to help pass along the Bitcoin to the rightful owner. So as long as a second key is passed along, you could set it up so that your seed phrase is given to an attorney with a phone number to call our concierge team and set it up so that you know, if anything were to happen to me, make sure that this seed phrase gets passed along to my partner or my child. As long as that proper title has been established, all your partner or child needs to do is reach out to us with that seed phrase and we can help recover the Bitcoin. Now, obviously, once again, title needs to be enforced from a legal perspective, but your loved one doesn't even need to do know what this seed phrase can do technically speaking right because at the end of the day we will help walk through hey you need to buy a new hardware wallet put in the seed phrase sign the transaction we'll sign the second transaction we will always help recover the bitcoin and the benefit of that being in that structure you're also not relying on that individual lawyer or loved one uh, as the end all be all because if they were to you know uh, try and maliciously act on that seed phrase they're in the same situation we're in. They only have one key. They don't have the ability to access the Bitcoin, but you can set up additional redundancy points so that if lawyer number one lost the seed phrase or didn't do a good job of passing along to the next of kin, you could have a second lawyer or a loved one make sure to pass along the seed phrase. At the end of the day, you need to help ensure title on your side of things, but we can help from a possession standpoint because we're always going to share the responsibility of holding one of those three keys. So if you can ensure that at least one of your keys is passed along, being both in the hardware wallet form or the seed phrase, we can help you recover the Bitcoin. So as the third bullet point suggests here, Unchained can help with possession, uh, but the title side still needs to be enforced by an attorney through any of the ways that Jeff was just talking through. Now, outside of the revocable living trust and outside of the actual process of helping recover the Bitcoin, which once again can be done by making sure a seed phrase or a key is passed along and a phone number to call Unchained Capital's concierge team, uh, there are additional ways you can leverage our platform. So as Jeff mentioned, we also have an IRA product where you can roll over your IRA or old 401k into real Bitcoin in the same two of three structure. With our IRA product that's just set up like any other IRA, you have the ability to establish beneficiaries and contingent beneficiaries. So for one of the non-probate assets, there's a really clear line uh, of delineation in terms of where those assets are passed along to. Once again, we just need that title enforced, which from an unchained IRA perspective, that title is enforced by the beneficiary itself. And we need to make sure a second key is passed along. And finally, through our concierge onboarding service, of course, we will always help clients recover Bitcoin and help move Bitcoin to the proper locations. Uh, but through our concierge onboarding service, if you sign up for that, we will also happily talk through your specific security setup and how best to manage and secure the hardware wallets themselves and their respective seed phrases. So I know that was a lot. I imagine that will uh, segue into our broader Q&A as well. Uh, but in short, there are a lot of different ways that you can leverage uh, Unchained Capital and the accounts within Unchained Capital to help pass along your Bitcoin and, and build into that broader Bitcoin inheritance plan. So with that, um, we can open up the conversation to Q&A here. I see lots of questions coming through the chat. 
Um, so I will uh, transition the conversation here, take a look at some of these questions, and we can just get right into it. So um, the top question uh, from <clears throat> Philip, and maybe Jeff, I'll pass this one to you. If I already have an estate plan, living trust, for example, how do I incorporate my Bitcoin into it? Now, I think this is slightly separate from the idea of building an account on our platform registered on that trust. Uh, but Jeff, maybe I'll pass it over to you for a little more color. Yeah, there. so if you get it titled to the trust, it's going to pass just like every other asset under your trust, whatever the whatever the dispositive provisions of the trust document say. So in terms of getting it titled into the trust, I mean, it's going to depend if that Bitcoin is hopefully on the Unchained platform, uh, you can reach out to us and we will open up a new vault for you titled to the Living Trust. So that's how you would handle it if it's on the Unchained platform. Uh, if for some reason it's not on the Unchained platform, let's say it's sitting in single sig, which we don't recommend for security reasons, but let's say it was, uh, you could actually execute an assignment document um, that basically just, and keep it with your trust that says all Bitcoin held under this address or this XPUB, you would have to identify it in some sort of way. Uh, you know, I hereby assign and transfer to the trustee of the John Doe Living Trust under, uh, you know, dated July 4th, 2021 or whenever you drafted it up. So that would be a similar assignment document that you would use for any sort of, uh, you know, asset that didn't have a formal title. If it's on the, but again, if it's on the Unchained platform, uh, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, you just need to reach out to us and we will open up a vault all properly titled for you to the revocable living trust. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, this next question I'm going to leverage as a plug for the previous webinar we did, which can live, which is living on our YouTube channel. And you can go back and watch that uh, where we focused uh, an entire hour on the landscape of Bitcoin taxes in the U S uh, but Jeff, I'll, I'll still throw this one to you. What are the tax implications uh, with inheriting Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, it's an. Uh, uh, you're, unfortunately, you're going to hear me say this a lot. It's like any other asset. It's not treated any differently from inheriting stocks or bonds, for instance. So uh, if the total value of your estate exceeds the estate tax threshold, which currently is around, it changes every year with inflation. Federally is around $12 million for a, a single person and around 24 million for a married couple. Uh, then there's a state tax. Uh, your particular state may have a lower state tax threshold. Most states have gotten rid of a state tax, but a few of them still have it floating around. Um, but that's the main thing. Uh, in you know, other than that, I mean, there's not any tax imposed at your death on the Bitcoin. Your beneficiaries get a stepped up tax basis in your Bitcoin, just the exact same way they do in any stocks or bonds they inherit from you. Um, and if you have questions about what it means to get a stepped up tax basis, I would say listen to that webinar that Connor just plugged. Uh, we sort of talked about that in last month's webinar at length. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. I see a lot of inheritance questions in here, so I will certainly keep that going. But there's a really important question about our broader platform that I want to take a moment to address. Uh, this question comes from Claire, and it is, what happens if Unchained Capital goes under and you have one of three keys? Uh, which kind of goes back to the joke I was making about whether if we were to disappear off the face of the earth, or you know, a maybe slightly more realistic scenario, although I still believe it's unrealistic, Bitcoin is made illegal overnight and we're forced to shut down. You know, importantly, all of this goes back to that multi-signature address and the fact that we are helping you build addresses directly on the Bitcoin network. The Bitcoin does not live in any of these individual devices and it doesn't live at Unchained Capital either. We are helping you build this two of three address that lives on the Bitcoin blockchain and the Bitcoin is associated with that address. So if we were to disappear off the face of the earth, you don't have the ability to use our one key anymore, but you should still be securing your two private keys. And although you can use our platform to interact with the Bitcoin network and access your wallet, it's not the only place that you can access your Bitcoin, because once again, Bitcoin is decentralized and open source. You can use any different number of open source tools 
to actually rebuild your wallet using a wallet configuration file and accessing your Bitcoin using your two keys. Uh, there is Sparrow, there is Electrum. We've created our own open source tool for clients called Caravan. Any of these uh, open source tools allow you to upload a wallet configuration file that you can download directly from our platform and leverage your two private keys and this open source technology with an internet connection from anywhere in the world to access your Bitcoin. So in short, the answer to this question is, what happens if Unchained Capital goes under and you lose one of our keys? It does not impact your ability at all to access your Bitcoin. And ultimately, that is what makes our platform here at Unchained Capital so unique. You are getting private wealth type services, whether it's for personal Bitcoin, for your IRA, for a revocable living trust, you are getting the benefit of all of these different services while still being able to custody the asset the entire time. So without going too deep into the actual recovery process, I definitely would point you towards our YouTube channel, as well as this is a really important component that we walk through in our concierge onboarding. And frankly, in my opinion, the most important thing that we walk through in that concierge onboarding call is showing you how to do this yourself. Because at the end of the day, Unchained Capital doesn't want to be a single point of failure either. And with the proper education, even if we disappear off the face of the earth, it doesn't impact your ability to access your Bitcoin. With that said, let's hope Unchained Capital is here for a very long time and none of the scenarios we just talked about actually end up uh, playing out. So to go back into the uh, inheritance questions here, I see several different questions on a uh, step-up basis. This one comes from Daniel, but I think there are a couple of different in the chat here. I'll try and consolidate them all into the same type of question. But in short, it seems like there are several questions that ask about step-up basis uh, for Bitcoin held in a trust. And Jeff, maybe that's a great place to start the conversation. I can add on any additional comments as I find them. Yeah, if you're talking about a revocable living trust of the type that you're doing to avoid probate, yes. You get the same step-up as if you had held it in your own name when you died. Um, certain other types of trust, the answer is no, uh, but that's those are more that's more sophisticated stuff. Um, and if you're setting up something like that, it's definitely something your attorney would let you know. But I think the question here is probably regarding the revocable living trust we were talking about for privacy purposes. And yes, you do get a basis step up. Okay, great. And then a second step up basis uh, question here. For non-retirement Bitcoin, is there still a step up in the cost basis? Yeah. So, uh, in fact, there there's no step up in for Bitcoin in a in an IRA. That's not how that's not how IRAs work. Um, so it's in fact only non-retirement Bitcoin that you get a step up in basis. And this is no different than again, I own like a broken record a little bit, but same with stocks and bonds. Uh, like if you hold a share of uh, stock in a regular brokerage account, you get a step up in basis when you die, or in an RLT brokerage account, you get a step up in basis when you die. If you hold it in an IRA, you do not. Um, so that's just sort of, basis is not a uh, relevant concept in IRAs because no gain, uh, gains and losses on sale transactions within an IRA are not taxable. So cost basis is not like a, it's not a thing for lack of a better term. Great, thank you. Um, I don't know how deep we can go on this next question from John, but under once under what circumstances, if any, might Bitcoin need to be liquidated in an inheritance scenario? I have a feeling this is probably similar to how stocks and bonds are treated, but I'll leave it to you, Jeff. That is correct. It is exactly like stocks or bonds would be treated. Um, if the beneficiary uh, is willing to take, I mean, the executor can always make an in-kind distribution of the assets. Uh, if the beneficiary doesn't want it or is unable to accept it in-kind, in-kind just means in its original form, so in Bitcoin, then the executor can liquidate it and, uh, um, you know, distribute the dollars instead. If you feel particularly strongly about it, you can include specific instructions in your will or RLT about how it should be distributed. Uh, it's definitely something you can do. Um, but like, there, just because something goes through probate doesn't need it doesn't mean it needs to be liquidated. I mean, like if, and again, this is just like stocks and bonds or even your house. Uh, there's no rule that that has to be liquidated. Your house oftentimes will be because if three people are inheriting it, they usually don't want to like all three live in the house together, right? But 
Bitcoin is infinitely divisible and stocks and bonds are usually are not infinitely divisible, but they're pretty divisible. Um, so that's less of an issue with that kind of thing. Great. Thanks, Jeff. I'll take this next question from Mary Lou because I think it's a really important one uh, that speaks to our platform. If I don't choose the, to, to continue with the concierge onboarding services, there are a way for my heir to add it at my passing. So maybe to clarify a bit here, our concierge onboarding service is a service that is optional that you can add on to your initial Unchained Capital setup, where we will walk you through how to use these devices, how to build a vault, how to go through that open source recovery process. Uh, it is completely optional. It's definitely how a majority of our clients get onboarded. Uh, some clients don't need any support. They are very familiar with self-custody and they just want to leverage our two of three platform and our financial services. Other clients are going from not owning any Bitcoin to holding their own private keys uh, using a hardware wallet. And so those types of clients and, and a lot of clients in between want support in getting set up on our platform. That concierge onboarding service, there's a couple of different ways to go through that, whether you go through our IRA product or if you're just setting up a personal vault or a business vault. In short, that's what that concierge onboarding call is for, is to really help you get comfortable and provide you the education on how to use our platform. To clarify though, that is completely different than this service that Jeff and I have been referring to in regards to helping you recover your Bitcoin and your private keys. Whether you sign up for the concierge onboarding service or not, as long, once again, as long as that title is established effectively, and one of the keys has been passed along, we will absolutely help you recover that Bitcoin. Um, I, I think to Jeff's point, there isn't an additional inheritance planning service that you need to sign up for, for us to assist you with that. We can't help enforce the title component of it, but we will always help a client recover the Bitcoin, assuming that title is in place and we have a second key. Because at the end of the day, if you came to us and said, hey, I'm the rightful owner of this Bitcoin. My, my father was an unchained client. Please help me recover the Bitcoin. I'm going to say, sorry for your loss. Absolutely happy to help. I see that you're the legal owner here. Where's the second key? At the end of the day, if we don't have that second key, there's nothing we can do in terms of ac accessing the Bitcoin. So just wanted to spend a moment to clarify on that. The concierge onboarding service, I highly recommend. It's a really good education and it will help you feel more comfortable using our platform. Whether you sign up for that concierge onboarding service, we will, of course, always help you recover the Bitcoin. Once again, with the caveat that that title needs to be in place and we need to have a second key. And just one uh, one further clarifying point. Uh, if your loved one needs help with hardware while it's like needs concierge onboarding, they would just pay for it at that time. Uh, you know, so regardless of whether you signed up for it or not, if they need that extra assistance that you may or may not have needed when you onboarded to Unchain, your executor has the same option to either sign up for that concierge onboarding or not sign up for that concierge onboarding when they sort of come onto the Unchained platform. Yeah, it's a great clarification. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, questions are still flowing through. I uh, appreciate all of the participation here. And just as a reminder in that bottom right uh, corner of the window is where you can submit additional questions and vote on questions that you'd like answered. We have a question on the Unchained IRA product uh, in regards to beneficiaries. Is it, If a beneficiary is named on the Unchained IRA, does that convey title if no will is present? Yeah, so all IRAs, the Unchained IRA is not unique in this regard. Um, the will doesn't matter. Uh, it's completely irrelevant to the situation. Uh, what, whoever you name on the IRA itself as the death beneficiary is who receives the IRA at your death. Um, so if, if you're only accounted on chain as an IRA, it doesn't matter. We wouldn't, we wouldn't even ask for a copy of a will or who the executor is or who your trustee is. The only relevant, uh, question with regard to that IRA at your death is who was named as death beneficiary on the IRA itself. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, very quick question here from Mike. Uh, is there an additional cost to set up the vault in the name of the trust? Uh, the short answer here is that from an actual setup perspective, uh, you can either set it up on your own or go through the concierge onboarding. That cost is no different. There is an annual maintenance fee uh, for all business accounts and trust accounts. Uh, that would include an account that is uh, registered on behalf of a revocable living trust. 
At this time, the annual maintenance fee for your first business account is $250, and every business account after that is $100. Uh, here's a question in regards to, uh, in uh, you know, kind of setting up the title that I think would be interesting to go through. This question is from Patrick. Uh, does your assets need to be named the same as your trust's name to be considered a, in the trust? Less IRAs, bank accounts, would Bitcoin holding need to be named the same as your trust? I think the question here is for Bitcoin that you own, how is that, how is the ownership transferred to, to be owned under that trust if it's not current? Yeah. So for Bitcoin on the Unchained platform, it would be just, you know, you reach out to Unchained. We consider a trust account to be a business account, which is a little bit of funny terminology, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, and our, you know, client solutions team will help you get a business account open title to your living trust, and you would just move your coins into a vault that is part of that business account. So very easy in terms of how to handle that with any Bitcoin on the Unchained platform. Uh, with regard to any Bitcoin, as I said before, not on the Unchained platform, it's a, a little more difficult. You would need to actually execute an assignment document. Uh, your attorney may have done a similar one for you. It's the same kind of document. When you set up a living trust, usually your attorney gives you sort of a, a template assignment document to use for assigning things like your jewelry to your living trust or other things around the house that don't have like a title listed on them you would use a, a document similar to that uh, in, to assign uh, you know, title to your Bitcoin not held on the Unchained platform. But again, with regard to something on the Unchained platform, uh, it's very easy. We, uh, we have the ability to just sort of retitle it for you and you're all good to go. Hopefully nobody here is holding their Bitcoin custodially, uh, but I guess I should mention that if you're like holding your Bitcoin on Coinbase or something like that, you would need to make sure that that custodial account is titled to the revocable living trust and they would have, you know, some sort of process for that. Excellent. I got a feeling uh, this answer will be similar to some others in terms of it's really no different, but uh, this next question comes from Angela. Uh, regarding divorce, what would the process be for dividing an unchained account pursuant to divorce and how would you value a retirement account? So yeah, it sounds so like two I mean, separate questions there. There'll be some, depending on whether you live in a community property state or a separate prop. So most people in the United States live in separate property states. Uh, there are a few states that are community property states like Texas and California. Um, either way, it'll have a different name depending on whether you live in a community property or a separate property state. But you're going to get some kind of a court order that tells how all your assets are going to be divided up, not just your Bitcoin, everything. Um, so if that court order says how to divide your Bitcoin, well, you have a quorum of keys. So you have the ability to send that Bitcoin to your spouse to comply with the court order without us. You don't need us for that. Um, if you somehow lost one of your keys and you need us to sign a transaction to send some Bitcoin to your spouse so that you can comply with the court order that the court gave you, uh, then just like any other transaction where you ask us to sign, we'll do all our normal identity verification stuff and we'll sign any transaction that you tell us to sign. Um, so typically the court order would normally be issued against you, not us, uh, because we don't have the ability to divide coins or move coins without your signature, at least from at least one of your keys. So typically that would be the procedure. I mean, you're going to get a court order saying how many coins you have to give your spouse. Uh, you can either transfer those coins to her via, you know, you have two keys. So you're able to do that without us. Or if you need us to sign, just like we don't, we don't care on our end, whether it's as part of a divorce transaction, like we don't ask you why you're moving your coins. That's your business. So uh, you would just instruct us to sign a transaction and we go through our normal processes and we would provide one signature and you would provide one signature if you're not able to provide both. If you lose both your keys, then we can't help you, uh, unfortunately. And you'll have to uh, convince the court that you've lost your keys, I suppose, and are physically unable to comply with the order. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, rolling right along here because we have plenty of questions in the queue. Um, so this next question comes from Wes. I'll take this one just because I think it's a really important component of understanding our platform. 
Uh, the, the question in short is if someone already has one unchanged capital vault and wants to establish a second vault, whether that is an IRA vault or perhaps a vault on behalf of a trust, does it require a new set of keys? Uh, and the short answer here, uh, in, in new set of private keys, the answer is no. You can use the same two hardware wallets to build as many vaults on our platform as you'd like. And that's really the <clears throat> how our platform is designed. So with one login, one username and password, and your two hardware wallets and their seed phrases, of course, you can manage all of your Bitcoin wallets in the same place. Now we are creating different two of three vaults. So your personal Bitcoin is going to sit in its own unique two of three address. And then your IRA Bitcoin is going to sit in a different address. So it's not like they're all commingled, but you can use the same two hardware wallets to establish as many vaults on our platform as you'd like. And that could even span for your reference that can even span across profiles. So a lot of spouses or individuals that want to get their kids involved in the space, they will use the same two hardware wallets and seed phrases for the entire household. So even though there's multiple unchained capital profiles that may be in question here, you can still use the same two hardware wallets. Our platform works with treasures, ledgers, and cold cards. So one of the other questions was, can a personal vault have two keys managed by two different logins? And I just want to clarify here because the answer on the personal vault side is no, but a huge feature of our business accounts, whether you're setting up for an LLC or once again, maybe a revocable living trust that has multiple trustees on it, you can have shared view accounts. So within a business account, you can have the standard business account allows you to have up to two different logins associated with the same account. So whether you are uh, a co-owner of a small business or a co-trustee of a trust, you and your other co-trustee, for example, could set up a vault registered on behalf of the trust. You still have two keys and we hold the third, but you can establish that so that co-trustee number one holds one key, co-trustee number two holds the second key, and Unchained Capital holds the third key. Those two co-trustees could have their own Unchained Capital profile, still manage their own personal Bitcoin without being able to see the other person's and have that shared visibility of a business account or a trust account, which is how a lot of our clients set up this type of structure uh, for a variety of different reasons. Once again, redundancy, you can help share that responsibility of holding keys, making sure that at least one key is passed on from an inheritance planning standpoint. So this is another good question on the inheritance planning side when it comes to like setting up an account on behalf of a trust. I'll throw this one to you, Jeff. If you have a revocable living trust, is there any need to title the unchained IRA in the revocable living trust since it's an IRA and has established beneficiaries? Uh, so uh, you can't title an IRA to a revocable living trust. Uh, the federal statute that creates IRAs doesn't allow that. Um, you can name... Uh, a trust as benefic as death beneficiary of your IRA uh, rather than naming the individuals themselves. Uh, there are reasons for doing or not doing that. That's something to talk to your estate planning attorney about. That's a sort of in-depth uh, question as to whether you'd want to do it that way. If they're minors, you probably want to name uh, a trust rather than a minor directly, for instance. Uh, but there's a lot of different considerations there. Um, but the good news is like, even if your attorney is not overly, um, familiar with Bitcoin, it's not treated any differently than stocks, bonds, any other asset in that regard. It's the same calculus there. Um, so you should be able to, you know, provide you some advice. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Another question, just kind of looking down the, uh, the potential future roadmap for Unchained, and I'd be curious your thoughts as our head of retirement and inheritance. Uh, do you think there will be the option to add a TOD to an individual non-IRA account at some point, uh, like you currently can with a brokerage account? Does regulation need to change to allow for this? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we've had discussions about this internally. Um, the answer is we will probably be able to do this uh, in the future. Uh, it is a little trickier for us than a brokerage due to the fact that we are not a custodian of the assets, right? 
that makes the the situation uh, a little trickier. So we don't want to create legal ambiguity for you. So uh, not a real satisfying answer, but it's definitely something on our roadmap and something that I'll be, I believe we will eventually be able to implement. Um, just not at this time due to the fact that, like I said, it is trickier for a company like us to do it than it is for something like a brokerage or even like a custodial Bitcoin provider can do it very easily the same way that a, that a brokerage can. But obviously in those situations, not your keys, not your Bitcoin, right? So you're, you're giving up a lot there uh, to, to get that. Absolutely. And I think, you know, what I always try to remind clients when speaking with them is that <clears throat> we are really building a service here to have you hopefully as a client for your entire life and potentially your kids' lives and your kids' kids' lives. Uh, the idea of our, our, the broader vision of our company is to be able to provide every single financial service that you might possibly need for your Bitcoin on the same place while allowing you to custody the assets. And so know that the services that we offer today, we're really just scratching the service in terms of what we're going to be able to offer the clients down the line. Uh, looks like we might have time for one or two more questions here. I think this is a really interesting one to, to get into with our last bit of time here remaining. And I can imagine, Jeff, you can only go so into this process, but this question is from John. You know, what is the process of verifying the identity of trustees or beneficiaries? So we've talked a lot about ensuring that you know, we can help with the possession side of things, but you need to have title enforced. How does that process actually look in practice in terms of this individual says that, you know, they are the executor of the estate or the son of this individual who has all the Bitcoin? How do we handle that from an internal standpoint? Yeah. So one thing is regarding the question, we would never care about the benefit, uh, the uh, identity of the beneficiaries because that we deal with the trustee or the executor. It's the trustee or the executor's uh, job to deal with the actual underlying beneficiaries and ensure that they are who they say they are. So in the case of an executor, uh, we would require whatever your particular state provides. Uh, in some states, that's a court order. Uh, in other states like New Jersey, that's an order from an administrative office appointing the executor, but that is a government document and it is a public record. So it's easy enough for us to verify uh, who the executor of the estate is. And then in terms of verifying the identity, it's, uh, you know, we're, we can't disclose what our normal KYC processes are, um, but we would use the same KYC process we would do, we would use when, you know, someone is onboarded um, to ensure that they are who they say they are. Um, with regard to a trustee, again, in terms of, you know, ensuring the trustee is who he says he is, um, we're going to use the same, we're going to use our normal identity verification and KYC processes in terms of who the correct trustee is. We rely on the trust document, uh, which we get a copy of when you onboard the trust. Um, so that would designate in that, you know, who the successor trustee is when you die. Uh, we would probably ask for a death certificate also to ensure that the preceding trustee is dead. Um, you know, and that's generally the, you know, the long and short of that situation. It's important to keep in mind that, uh, we have no ability to move your coins, even if someone were to maliciously, uh, insert themselves into this situation, right? Obviously, it's something that hasn't happened. We take great care and safeguards to ensure it doesn't happen, but they would need to both maliciously insert themselves this way and also recover one of your other keys because they need two of your keys to move your actual coins. So in this way, Unchained is not a single point of failure. Uh, even if we screwed up, someone would still have to also be able to get physical possession of one of your other keys. Excellent. Well, um, you know, based off of the activity in, in the chat and the questions box, I think we could be going all day here, but I will spare you. I know you have a new hammer that you're looking to uh, test out. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up here. We appreciate everyone uh, joining and all of the, uh, you know, participation in our session today. Uh, a couple of last thoughts. So uh, this is going to be recorded. A replay will be available if you stay on this link uh, shortly. You can just watch it immediately after. We will also be posting it on YouTube. Uh, if you do have questions and would like to set up time to speak with our team to learn more about anything we talked about on our platform today, uh, there is a link 
popping up on the screen now, the screen now where you can schedule directly with us. And if you're watching on YouTube, just go to unchain.com. There's a big button that says schedule a consultation and we'll get you in the right place. Uh, with that, a couple of last thoughts. Uh, our next webinar is going to be on Wednesday, May 4th. Jeff and I have a standing discussion talking through the Unchained IRA, answering any questions you may have on that product more specifically. And as always, we'll be back for another Retirement and Inheritance webinar series next month. With that, thank you all so much for your time. Jeff, as always, thanks for uh, enlightening us. And we'll uh, wrap it there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.